Okay guys, I got one more video for Malaysia to get out to you before I head to Munich. And this one's a really cool one because this also shows another aspect of the show, the seminar series, which I was able to attend. It was a smaller show, so I usually don't get to see the seminars. This one I recorded for you because it also was something of interest to me. It was a Rob Watts with Cord, and I've always been intrigued with their filter design. Yes, most DACs do sound, you know, relatively the same, but a lot of the differences don't so much come from parts anymore. It comes from the analog stage, the power supply, and the filters that they use. And this video is going to showcase how Cord does things differently. And I've tried their, their filters as well using HQ Player. Well, not their exact filters, but simulating some of their filters in HQ Player. And I even got to do some Q&A at the end of this presentation. So I think you're going to enjoy this presentation, especially if you use Cord. But if you don't know anything about Cord and their approach, this is another video I think that'll be helpful to you. Enjoy, guys. So, the perception of Tamra depends upon transients. If you remove the transient information from, from instruments, it becomes very difficult. So they did Tycho artistic uh, experiments where they removed the sound of the transients from a trumpet and a piano, and it became very difficult to find out what, what you were actually listening to. Transients in location. So the timing of transients is a central perceptual cue. The brain measures the, the timing difference, as the guy in, in, in the previous um, uh, talk was talking about, um, between the left ear and the right ear, and it's called the interaural time delay. This is used as one perceptual cue to determine left to right. Um, and the brain can calculate placement accuracy from this timing information to within one degree of, of accuracy. It also uses timing information to calculate depth. So when you're listening to a dog barking in a valley below, and the valley is two kilometers, the dog is two kilometers away, you can perceive that dog as being two kilometers away. And part of the information that's being used is timing information, so the brain calculates what the depth actually is. Interaural time delay. Keep going. Um, so the brain has a mechanism for measuring the timing difference from the ears. And if you read textbooks in the past, people would say this resolution limit was about four to six microseconds. But recent research papers has shown that it doesn't matter how small the timing difference is, the brain can respond to it. So there's no resolution limit for timing differences that the brain can work towards. So, why is digital audio so bad? It's all down to the timing of transients. We perceive pitch from transients. We perceive sound stage from transients. We perceive timbre from transients. We perceive the starting and stopping of notes from transients. Transients are important also for instrument separation and focus. The trouble with digital audio is that it's sampled information. And we've got one sample with CD, and then 22 microseconds later, we've got another sample. And what the DAC has to do is to recover the timing information. In other words, recover the original waveform from one sample to the next sample. Very small timing errors can have a very substantial impact to your listening experience. Um, and the trouble is, conventional DACs are very poor at reconstructing the original transient timing information. That makes the sounds muddled and confused and give you listening fatigue. So we can see um, an illustration of the timing problem. So um, imagine we've got a, 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 a burst signal. So this is a 20 kilohertz burst signal. Um, and the you can see the start and we're actually 
the first sample is being started at the beginning when it's zero. And the digital data then builds up, and you can see this, this um, sample data building up as it covers the transient. So what do we do when we put that into a, an interpolation filter? If we put that into a simple interpolation filter, we get what's coming out on the, on the yellow trace. So this has got a transient error of around 100 microseconds, which is a huge number. This occurs with NOS filters, IR filters, minimum <coughs> phase filters, and MQA filters. Basically, all of the high-end audio filters that, that are available. But the solution to this is to use what's known as a sync function interpolation filter. And if we had an infinite processing sync function filter, we would perfectly reconstruct the original bandwidth limiter signal. That's what the mass tells us, that's what sampling theory tells us, and it's completely true. It even reconstructs the, the first pulse that wasn't actually there. So we can perfectly reconstruct the transient timing. But to perfectly reconstruct, you must have an infinite number of taps. Taps is a term that we use to determine how much processing the filter is, filtering is going on. Um, so you need infinite number of taps with sync coefficients. They must be sync. But a sync function filter with an infinite amount of taps will pre-ring, that's at the beginning of, 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 of the impulse, and post-ring, and it will ring for an infinite period of time. But everybody in the business says pre-ringing is bad, that having these, this ringing before the impulse is a very bad thing. Everybody is wrong. The reason for this is that pre-ringing is actually essential to recover the transient timing information. So pre-ringing from the future is used to reconstruct the correct transient, the signal that was in the ADC, the analog signal we're trying to recover before sampling. Without the pre-ringing, it's impossible to reconstruct the original. Um, and the more pre-ringing we have, the more accurate the reconstruction is. The funny thing about this, the paradox about this, is that if we use a bandwidth-limited impulse, which is a legal signal within, within digital audio, um, it will be perfectly reproduced with a sync function filter, even though it's got an infinite amount of pre- and post-ringing. And you'll end up with the original impulse being perfectly reconstructed. So, knowing all this, how do we make the best sounding FIR filter? Simple question, difficult answer. And it's, to be honest, it's taken me over 40 years to come up with a, a good solution to, to, to this problem. It's a much, much more complicated than I can talk about in, 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 in this short seminar. Um, we know that to perfectly recover transit timing all the coefficients must be synced. That's what the theory tells us, and it's a fact. But if we were to use only sync on our interpolation filters, we'd have a problem. Because at the beginning of the filter, it suddenly goes from zero, because it's not doing anything, to fully sync. And that sudden change will cause a problem. And that abrupt change itself creates transient timing errors, which becomes audible and that makes poorer sound quality. So, what happens with conventional audio filters is that they severely taper the sync coefficients to improve the filter's measured performance. It's all about measurements when you're designing a, a conventional filter. None of the coefficients are the ideal sync value. This creates transient timing errors that are very audible and that gives you poor sound quality, irrespective of the number of the taps. So the algorithm, that's the recipe that you use to calculate the, the, the coefficients, is very, very important and makes a huge difference to the sound quality. 
Um, traditional algorithms are just maths based. Nobody does any listing tests. It's not optimized for count sound quality. It's there for good measured performance. And everybody ignores the transient timing recovery problem that, that I'm talking about. So what do we do? We need a filter um, that doesn't have the sudden change from zero to full sync, but we also need to make sure that the maximum number of coefficients are the pure ideal sync, sync values. And this is what my WTA algorithm actually does. It's uniquely specified to optimize the reconstruction of transient timing for the best sound quality possible. So, the WT algorithm, that's the recipe to create the coefficients, it's been optimized for over 25 years. The equation to calculate the coefficients is a unique one. It's got five discrete variables. Each one changes the actual coefficients subtly. Each variable has been adjusted, adjusted and optimized with thousands of different listening tests. These variables um, were fine-tuned by ear to 10 parts per million, or 0.001%, so it's an incredibly small value. Half the coefficients, or over half the coefficients, are ideal sync, sync function and values. No other filter algorithm is designed in this way, nor performs like this. But, I mentioned earlier, I use listening tests to optimize it. How do I know that the listening test is actually working, that we're, we're getting the right performance? This is actually a really big, big problem, because when you're listening to something, you weren't present at the original recording, you don't know how the recording engineer has, has, has uh, done everything, changed everything. So how do we make an assessment that we're actually getting much better sound? And the key is variations. So when I'm doing my listing tests, I'm looking at variations in space, depth and left and right placement, variations in timbre, so having a very bright instrument playing at the same time as a very rich instrument and getting those tonal colors to, uh, to come through. Variations in pitch, um, particularly low frequency pitch because low frequency is a big problem with, with, with transient timing. Variability in dynamics, the rhythm and the sense of flow. Instrument separation and focus, this is also very, very important with, with uh, transient timing. The, obviously the ability to perceive the starting and stopping of notes. This is great for electronic and music because they have a very fast stop and start time. Clarity, this is a, similar to transparency but not quite the same as transparency. And what I had to do was to listen to all these different, different factors, score them and then adjust the coefficients so they hit the sweet spot and there was always a sweet spot and sometimes I had to go back and redo the other variables so it was quite a quite an intense process <coughs> so the tap length history um, going back to 1999 we only had a thousand taps um, with a DAC called electronics DAC 64 um, 18,000 taps with the QBD, 26,000 taps with the Hugo in 2013, 164,000 taps with Dave, and then with the Hugo M scaler, um, we hit 1 million taps. Every time I increased the tap length, the sound quality got better. Um, and with improvements to the WT algorithm, I, I got better performance with no change in, 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 in tap length. What do you get when you increase the tap length and tweak the, 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 the algorithm? Much better bass definition, improved sound staging, instrument separation and focus, being more varied on timbre. Reduction in listening fatigue. Listening fatigue is a major issue um, with, with digital audio. Being able to listen all day to music and then listening in the evening, um, that's a big benefit to this, this approach. And of course, we can perceive the starting and stopping of notes much more easily. So what's the key benefit of one million taps with the Hugo M scaler? 
So the good thing about when you hit one million taps is that we are now identical um, sync function values. Sorry, I've been, I've got some competition next door. Um, we've now got 16-bit accuracy on our sync, sync coefficients. This means that we are guaranteed to reconstruct to a six, better than 16-bit accuracy. Um, the best DACs available today, the reconstruction accuracy is only two or three bits. So what does one million taps give you? Um, so we're now reconstructing the original analog recording um, exceeding 16-bit accuracy. This gives you, transforms your ability to perceive pitch, melody, timbre and space. There's a more important thing. You emotionally connect to the original performance in a much better way. You can enjoy the music more. Um, and this is by far the biggest um, benefit of, of, of this approach. So, I managed to, to, to meet the time. Any, any questions? Yeah. Can you talk about the extra processing requirement to do a million tap filter? Yeah. Oh, can I talk about more? <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that, that's... Um, that, Does it's it done within an FPGA. Okay. Um, the FPGA I use is a, is a Xilinx 200T. That's got 720 DSP cores inside it. So you're using lots of DSP to, to do it. Um, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is the Quartet M scaler, um, which is a very high-end scaler to match Dave, um, our most expensive DAC. That's got five 200Ts, so that's two and a half thousand DSP cores. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of intense processing going on with it. I would think so. So when you hit play, it, it can play pretty much instantly. No, there's a there's, there's a a delay. still a delay. Okay. So the delay is 0.7 of a second with the M scaler, and it's three seconds with the Quartet M scaler. Okay. Um, so it needs the more time it has to to see the whole audio, the more accurately it can reconstruct the the, 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 the actual transit timing information. Okay. Um, great. So the more it sees, the more more accurate it becomes, and of course the more that you've got as being sync function coefficients. So, so that, that's the reason for the delay. Gotcha. Okay, thank you very much for listening, and I hope, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.